We're now having a business meeting. The committee's first agenda item is H.R. 3243, legislation to promote flexibility in work arrangements and scheduling for federal firefighters. H.R. 3243 was introduced by Representative John Sarbanes, Democrat Maryland, on July the 16th, 2009. The bill was forwarded to the, by the Federal Workforce Subcommittee by voice vote and on May the 27, 2010. H.R. 3243 allows federal firefighters to trade shifts without triggering mandatory overtime payments and added costs for their agency. The bill simply allows traded time to be excluded from the calculation of overtime. This grants more leave flexibility to these workers without costing the government any money. The change is consistent with the workplace practices of State and municipal fire departments across the country. Under the bill, any de decision approved, the workers' request to switch shifts would remain at the discretion of the employing agency. Trade time will boost Federal agencies' ability to recruit and retain trained firefighters. I support the bill and yield to the ranking member for any comments he may have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a good, non-controversial, well-worked-out bill that corrects a technical uh, problem that has existed for our uh, Federal firefighters that uh, we support on a bipartisan basis and yield back. If no other members seek recognition, I now call up H.R. 3243. H.R. 3243, a bill to amend Section 5. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendments at any point without objection so ordered. Hearing no amendments, the question is on agreeing to H.R. 3243 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 3243 as amended is agreed to, and without objection, H.R. 3243 as amended is ordered reported favorably to the House. Next, we have H.R. 40. H.R. 5367 was introduced by Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton of the District of Columbia on May the 24th. The bill makes a number of administrative and legislative changes to improve the operation of the D.C. courts and the public defender service of the district. With the passage of the Revitalization Act in 1997, the Federal Government assumed budgetary and legislative responsibility for some district offices, such as the D.C. Courts and the Public Defender Service. The Revitalization Act grants to Congress the exclusive authority to amend Title 11 of D.C. Code related to the D.C. Courts and related agencies. H.R. 5367 would give the Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals the ability to hold the Judicial Conference, which is required by stature, biennially or annually. The Chief Judge would also be able to require local magistrates judges to attend. H.R. 5367 also authorizes the Chief Judge of the Superior Court and the Court of Appeals to delay or toll various deadlines in the event of a natural disaster, terrorist attack, or other related emergency situations. The bill would also authorize the D.C. courts to enter into agreement for reimbursement for services provided by the District of Columbia. This provision will allow coordination of services at the administrative function among district agencies, which will help promote efficiency and ensure the proper allocation of resources. Lastly, H.R. 5367 would allow the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia to purchase professional liability insurance for the attorneys, staff, and board members out of their existing salaries and expense accounts. This is already standard practice for other Federal Public Defenders under with the Federal Criminal Justice Act. I encourage all members to support this good government measure, which will improve the management and efficiency of the courts and public defender's office in the District of Columbia. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, the ranking member, for any comments that he might have in reference to this bill. Mr. Chairman, with our longstanding uh, support for home rule, I support 53, uh, 5367 and its goals. We recognize that this bill has not officially been scored by CBO and promise to work on uh, such amendments as may be necessary should it be scored or to find those funds otherwise and yield back. If any other member is seeking recognition, I, I now call up H.R. 5367. The clerk will read the bill, the title of the bill. 
5367, a bill to amend Title XI, District of Columbia Official Code. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendments at any point without objection, so ordered. I have a manager's amendment at the desk, and the clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 5367, offered by Mr. Towns. Strike. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read and considered base text. Without objections, the amendment is considered as read, and I recognize myself for a few minutes to speak on the amendment. The amendment would add language to reduce the required term of service for judges in the Family Court Division of the Superior Court of the District from five years to three years. This change uh, was requested by Chief Judge of the Superior Court. The requirement to serve five years terms was hampered efforts to recruit judges. The Children's Law Center, which advocates for the rights of children in family court, is supportive of the change due to its potential to help with the rec recruiting of family court judges. I now yield to the ranking member for any comments that he might have on this specific legislation. Uh, no comments at this time. Yield back. If no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is now on the town's amendment and the nature of a substitute. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposes? No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment and the nature of a substitute is adopted. Are there any other amendments? The question is now on reporting H.R. 5367 as amended to the House. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And H.R. 5367 as amended is ordered, reported favorably to the House. The committee will now consider H.R. 5702, which was introduced by Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton on July the 1st, 2010. H.R. Uh, 5702 reduces the time that a vacant seat will be left open in the District of Columbia Council. Under current law, the District Board of Election and Ethics must hold a special election to fill a vacancy on the Council within 114 days after the vacancy occurs. There have been periods in the history of the Council where District residents remain unrepresented for nearly four months at a time. The 114-day rule is currently part of the Home Rule Act, a Federal statute. This bill would reduce the gap in representation for citizens of the District of Columbia. I now yield to the gentleman from California for any comments he might have on 5702. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And once again, uh, in the spirit of home rule, this is a decision for the people of the District of Columbia and their representatives. Uh, since this is a consensus reduction that they have chosen, I fully support it. To be honest, Mr. Chairman, I would have supported their ability to rule make these sort of things without coming back to us. But for now, this is a good way to meet the current requirement. Look forward to broader legislation that would give these kinds of details normally done uh, outside of our purview to uh, the District of Columbia. But at this time, I support the bill and yield back. Right. Thank you, gentlemen from California. If no other members wish to speak, I now call up H.R. 5702. The clerk will read the title of the bill. H.R. 5702, a bill to amend the District of Columbia Home Rule Act to reduce the waiting period. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendments at any point. Without objection, so ordered. Are there any amendments? Hearing none, the question is on agreeing to H.R. 5702. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 5702 as amended is agreed to. Without objection, H.R. 5702 as amended is ordered reported favorably to the House. The Committee now considers H.R. 5368, the United States Postal Service Postal Inspector, Inspector Equity Act. Uh, H.R. 5368 was introduced on May 24, 2010 by Representative Stephen Lynch. Uh, the bill would allow postal inspectors to receive full law enforcement availability pay uh, comparable to criminal investigators of other executive branch agencies. Postal inspectors protect the United States Postal Service 
its employees and its customers from criminal attacks and protect the Nation's mail system from criminal misuse. Under current law, compensations and benefits for postal inspectors are required to be comparable to other workers in the executive branch. Currently, the Postal Service is paying postal inspectors, but such payments are not required by statute. H.R. 5368 will require the Postal Service to pay postal inspectors leap by law, codifying current practice. The bill amends the Title V to define postal inspectors as law enforcement officers eligible to receive LEAP. H.R. 5368 will preserve and protect postal inspectors' law enforcement availability pay, ensure that the Postal Inspection Service will be able to recruit and retain highly qualified postal inspectors. I now yield to the gentleman from California for any comments that he might have. I thank the gentleman. and uh, I support the bill. I support recognition that law enforcement does not receive overtime pay, and yet they work long hours, often what anyone would consider to be on overtime. For most Americans, they are not even aware that there is a section uh, of, of the workforce that doesn't receive overtime pay, and yet truly are hourly workers. Law enforcement deserves to be treated as fairly as possible, even with the provision that overtime is not an ordinary term in their profession. LEAP is designed to guarantee comparative uh, fairness in pay. This bill clarifies that in a statutory way. I support it. Yield back. Any other members seeking recognition? If no other members wish to speak, I now call up H.R. 5368. The clerk will read the title of the bill. H.R. 5368, a bill to amend Titles 5 and 39. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendments at any point without objection so ordered. I believe I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment, please. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 5368, offered by Mr. Towns of New York. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Section 1, short title. This act may be cited. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read and considered as base text without objection. The amendment is considered as read, and I recognize myself for a few minutes to speak on the amendment. My amendment applies the bill's provision to special agents of the Postal Service Officer, Office of the Inspector General. Like postal inspectors, these special agents are criminal investigators who have been receiving leak. The amendment would codify this practice. The amendment also adds language requesting that the Postal Service making the bill provision retroactive. The amendment would make it clear that as law enforcement officers who have been receiving LEAP benefits, inspectors and special agents are not eligible for overtime pay under the Fair Labor Standards Act. This is consistent with the treatment of other Federal law enforcement officers. Uh, and, of course, finally, the amendment will change the short title to reflect the addition of special agents of the Inspector General to the bill. I now yield to the gentleman from California for any comments that he might have at this time. I thank the Chairman, and this is a good technical cor correction. I might note that this bill has not been officially score scored by CBO, but we do not anticipate receiving a score on this since the practice has already been to make these payments and therefore support both the bill and the amendment and yield back. Right. Thank you, gentlemen from California. Do any other members wish to speak on the amendment? If no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is now on the town's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposers say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is, is agreed to in the nature of a substitute. Is adopted. Are, any, are there any other amendments, any further amendments? The question is on reporting H.R. 5368 as amended to the House. All those in favor say aye. All opposers say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. And H.R. 5368 as amended is ordered reported favorably to the House. Our final order of business is marking, marking up post office. The clerk will designate the bill. Uh, I have a manager's amendment at the desk. Let me just uh, make technical corrections to H.R. 
uh, Res 6118 and H.R. Res 1494, and I ask unanimous consent that they be adopted and considered as base text. Will the clerk designate the amendment? H to H. Res? The bills. Uh, okay. Um, and Mr. Chairman, we are considering them in block. Is that on block, right? In block. Yeah, thank you. HRES 1494, congratulating the champion, finalists, and other participants in the 83rd Annual Scripps National Spelling Bee. Without H objection. HRES 1529, commending Bob Shepard for his long and respected career as the public address announcer for the New York Yankees and the New York Giants. HRES 1603, expressing support for designation of September 2010 as National Craniofacial Acceptance Month. HRES 1617, supporting the goals and purpose of Gold Star Mother's Day, which is observed on the last Sunday in September of each year in remembrance of the supreme sacrifice made by mothers who lose a son or daughter serving in the armed forces. HR 4602, designating the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 1332 Sharon Copley Road in Sharon Center, Ohio, as the Emil Bolas Post Office. H.R. 6118, designating the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 2 Massachusetts Avenue Northeast in Washington, D.C., as the Dorothy I. Height Post Office Building. S. 3567, designating the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 100 Broadway in Lynbrook, New York, as the Navy Corpsman Jeffrey L. Weiner Post Office Building. H.R. 6014, designating the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 212 Main Street in Hartman, Arkansas, as the M.R. Bucky Walters Post Office. H.R.E.S. 1442, supporting the goals and ideals of United States Military History Month. And H.R. 5877, designating the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 655 Center Street in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, as the Lance Corporal Alexander Scott or Adondo, United States Marine Corps Post Office Building. Having satisfied the committee's criteria, each of these measures are worthy of support, and I therefore urge their adoption. Does the ranking member have any comments at this time? Mr. Chairman, we reviewed the postal namings and commemorative resolutions before the committee today and find that they meet the standards of the committee. I would like to thank the Chairman for his, uh, his work on uh, H.R. 6118 uh, and uh, would yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from uh, uh, Tennessee, author of one of the bills. Well, I thank the uh, gentleman for yielding, and I simply want to say that uh, I appreciate the Chairman uh, taking up H.R. Uh, 1442, the uh, uh, resolution about a military history month. This, is, this has been submitted uh, at the request of uh, one of my constituents, a great historian, Ed Hooper, and it has often been said that a nation forgets its past at its peril, and certainly the military has played an extremely significant role in our history. This resolution creates a Military History Month and recognizes that uh, important role, and I ask unanimous consent to place a statement in the record concerning that legislation. Thank you. Without objections, so ordered. This concludes our business. That's California. I'm a gentleman from, from Washington, D.C. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to say a word about the Dorothy Height. Uh, first, I want to thank the committee for, for passing my other two bills while I was on my way here. And just and to say a word about the Dorothy Height naming bill. Dorothy Height was an icon of, of uh, the movements for women's rights and civil rights. Uh, we are naming, or would like to name in this bill, is about naming the old central post office near Union Station after Dorothy Height. I very much appreciate that the committee has considered this bill, along with my other two bills, uh, before adjournment. I yield back and thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I ask that my statements for all three bills be uh, entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the measures previously designated and amended be reported favorably by the committee. Without objections, so ordered. We have one more bill uh, to consider today, which we will take up at the conclusion of today's hearing. Uh, so we will now recess the business meeting and reconvene at the conclusion of the hearing. So we have a second panel that we would like to call up.
I would like to welcome our second panel. Mr. Stuart Bourne, Jr. has served as the Special Inspector General of Iraq Reconstruction since 2004. And before becoming the inspector, Bourne served President George W. Bush at the White House in roles including Deputy Assistant and Deputy Staff Secretary. Mr. Bourne also served at, on Governor George Bush's staff and as an Assistant Attorney General of Texas, Mr. Bourne spent four years on active duty in the United States Air Force. We welcome, of course, as we do with all of our witnesses, we swear you in. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. And of course, I'm sure you know the rules that, you know, you have five minutes and of course, as you know, and after four minutes, the yellow light comes on. And then after that minute, the red light comes on. And of course, the yellow light means sum up, red light means stop, and the, which will allow us an opportunity to raise some questions. And uh, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee. Uh, for this opportunity to appear before you today on the critical issue facing our country in Iraq right now. The title of the hearing captures it well. Transition in Iraq. Is the State Department ready to take the lead? Defining ready is a difficult task, as we heard from the first panel, and there are structural challenges, funding challenges, core competency challenges inherent in analyzing this question. But let me put it in context by identifying three ongoing evolutions in Iraq affecting our program. First, the U.S. effort is evolving from a large-scale contingency relief and reconstruction program to more, a more regular order, a more regularized foreign aid package. That is not to say that this isn't still a huge uh, funding initiative, a huge rebuilding effort still ongoing, one of the largest in the world today. Indeed, combining the supplemental and the fiscal year request, uh, the State Department is seeking $6.3 billion uh, to spend in Iraq over the next year, significant, one of the largest uh, foreign aid packages uh, operative today. Second evolution is the departure of DOD, down to 50,000 this this past September down to zero com, uh, active troops on the ground by the end of next year means that the security environment is fundamentally changing. The backdrop that DOD provided in movement across the country uh, is disappearing. And as a result, the State Department is requesting hundreds of millions, in fact, billions of dollars to fund continuing security. Uh, without that security, doing the job of foreign assistance, foreign support, foreign aid will become virtually impossible. And the third evolution is the changing nature of U.S. aid in the country. Uh, as was mentioned in the earlier panels, the provincial reconstruction teams are going away. Enduring's presence posts will replace them from 15 PRTs down to four enduring presence posts. Uh, the, the nature of our effort is also moving rapidly away from hard reconstruction, but we still continue to spend significant sums in the training of police and the training of Iraq's military. Sigurd's work raises several concerns about the readiness question regarding the State Department's operations in Iraq. We have conducted four audits of their police training program, uh, the largest contract in State Department history, $1.2 billion. Uh, managed by INL, not managed well. And as our audits have shown, the need for strengthening oversight, for better contract management, for actual increased personnel, uh, ensuring that the program goals are met uh, is essential to, to accomplish that critical task, bringing security to Iraq through its police, re-energized re police forces. Uh, second, our audits have raised concerns about grants 
and contracts that the State Department manages, identifying specifically that the contracting practices are weak, the grants management pro practices have been weak. This year we have issued three or two audits, the third one coming out shortly, on uh, the management of, of, a, of grants by NDI and IRI uh, through the, uh, DRL, Democracy Human Rights uh, Office in, in, in the State Department, and we found excessive costs uh, and inefficient management or oversight of the goals that were sought to be achieved through that program. The other piece that is a huge part of, of the pending supplemental and the pending funding is providing life support and security. Uh, the, the supplement has already provided $725 million uh, for security, and, and Secretary Liu said that will uh, is only a quarter of the needs, so significant additional funding necessary for security. And finally, the State Department is going to need to address uh, an issue that our office has repeatedly highlighted, and that is the oversight of asset transfer, the transfer of projects completed by the United States and, and transferred to Iraq, and the sustainment of those projects. The real waste, uh, in fact, may continue to occur in Iraq if those assets aren't effectively managed through a coordinated asset transfer program and if they are not sustained. Uh, the, the truth is that over the last couple of years, hundreds and hundreds of projects that the United States has funded and built have been transferred unilaterally to the government of Iraq. That is no way to run a rebuilding program. Uh, ultimately, uh, I think that the considerations that we recommend in our uh, report, which echo uh, those that I, I sent in a letter a year ago to the ambassador and the commanding general um, in Iraq, need to be applied to the continuing State Department program, namely strengthening contract program and grant management controls and continuing to invest or resource the State Department's capacity to carry out those missions. Uh, it is it's a fact that their overall contract effort has been identified as weak by the State Department IG, by the GAO, and by our reports. Uh, I think it is time for reform in, in that area is essential. But there is a larger reform, and let me close with that point that I think that was uh, expressed by the first panel and I think is evident uh, as a lesson learned, the hardest lesson learned from Iraq and, frankly, from Afghanistan, and that is the lack of an integrated system for managing contingency relief and reconstruction operations uh, overseas. This is not a new issue. We experienced it in the Balkans, Panama, Somalia. But Afghanistan and Iraq are the biggest ever in history, of course, combined over $100 billion spent, combined tens of billions wasted. Uh, that is not acceptable, notwithstanding the security challenges in both countries. And the, the path to reform, one of the mandates of this committee, the, the oversight and government reform, is reforming the U.S. approach uh, to structuring, executing, and being held accountable for contingency relief and reconstruction operations. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for the opportunity to appear, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bourne. Let me just announce before I start my question that the business meeting will reconvene at 2 o'clock. So uh, staff, make certain that uh, the members are aware of the fact that we will have the, the final um, meeting at 2. Okay. Uh, let me uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bourne, for your, um, uh, your statement. Uh, where do you see the major areas of fraud, waste, and abuse? I mean, where do you see these? Well, we, we have identified egregious examples of fraud who, through the course of our work over the last six years, 34 convictions to date, 50-plus uh, indictments. Uh, the, the latest phase of our work has involved a forensic review of all the money that is being used in Iraq uh, using a variety of electronic tools. I can't go into the details, but I can tell you that, that because of the excessive emphasis and use of cash on the ground to pay contractors, which still occurs in Iraq, especially through the Commander's Emergency Response Program, there have been those that have taken advantage of that situation and stolen the money through various means. And we are catching some of them, holding them accountable, and the DOJ is prosecuting them. On the waste front, much more significant problem. Um, 
five billion dollars we have estimated that has been wasted in the, in the overall Iraq reconstruction enterprise. That is symptomatic of a, of, uh, a variety of, of factors. Uh, one, the security challenges that, that force delays in, in projects and programs. Two, the changing policies that changed emphases in those projects and programs. Uh, three, the use of inappropriate contracting vehicles at the outset, namely very, very large cost plus programs that paid for failure, frankly, for too long until we moved away from cost plus to fixed price contracts, partly through our lessons learned report and our identification of that, uh, that unwise um, contracting vehicle. Could you go into details in terms of some of the things you found, specific kinds of things that you found? Sure. Sure. Kanban Isad Prison, uh, 60 miles north of Baghdad. $40 million U.S. taxpayer money spent uh, will never hold a prisoner. It is less than half built. Uh, the subcontractor was not properly overseen, repeatedly failed in accomplishing the goals uh, set. Uh, and finally, the contract was terminated uh, with the prime contractor. And finally, all the subcontracts were terminated because it was a failure. This is emblematic or, or perhaps the poster child of poor planning in Iraq in that the Deputy Minister of Justice told us uh, when we interviewed him on this inspection that the Iraqis never wanted that prison up in Diyala province anyway, and, and it should never have been started. So a, a failure in planning, a failure in contract management, a failure in program oversight, and ultimately $40 million wasted. 